There you go. All right. Very good. Perfect. Excellent. Well, I'll start it off here. So, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining. Sorry about that uh, technical difficulty at the start. But, uh, Kingston Economic Development Corporation is excited to be hosting this virtual event on Health Canada Compliance Insight and Strategies. The team, our team at Kingston Economic Development is here to help your business grow. Please check out the supports and resources our program can, our, uh, our programs we offer on our website, which I'll share in the chat function uh, shortly. Um, I'd also like to thank Andrew uh, Parashat, I think he said that right, but I said it wrong, um, and his team at Quality Smart Solutions for organizing and putting this session again together. Andrew has a lot to get through and to cover in the next hour. If you have any questions, if you could put them in the chat function at the bottom, that would be great. And without further ado, I will pass the floor over to Andrew. All right. Thanks very much, Ben. Appreciate it. And thank you for giving us this opportunity here to uh, educate and enlighten and incite uh, all of you that are attending here today uh, to learn about uh, regulatory insights to gain market access into the Canadian and U.S. markets. So, um, uh, yeah, you can go to the next slide. Uh, you can, yeah, perfect. Okay, great. So just a quick overview of uh, each of our companies here, uh, starting with Quality Smart Solutions. Um, Quality Smart Solutions is the, is the oldest of the three um, uh, divisions. So started in 2007, we've served over 1,200 clients, uh, com completed over 120,000 uh, services to date. And we have a, a growing team of 20 plus experts uh, with various backgrounds from former government agency employees, uh, both on FDA and Health Canada, through to uh, regulatory and quality assurance folks who've worked in uh, various companies in, uh, in across North America. Um, and so Quality Smart Solutions offers Health Canada and FDA regulatory and QA solutions in both consumer packaged goods as well as pharmaceuticals. Uh, so various areas from dietary supplements, foods, uh, cosmetics, um, OTC drugs, medical devices, pesticides, consumer health products uh, overall. So, uh, and then our quality assurance solutions include um, site audits, SOP writing, uh, QA designet services, um, and uh, non-conformance investigations, just to name a few. Next slide. Um, our second company, Quality Import Solutions. Uh, that company is a Health Canada licensed importer of uh, natural health products. So we have a site license. Um, and just as of uh, this year, we have uh, over 90 vendors, 92 vendors to be exact, uh, who work with us worldwide uh, to act as that import agent for their dietary supplements, natural health products into Canada. And we have a number of uh, 3PL partners warehouses um, in Canada, and we have a growing number of 3PL partners in the US that can uh, store those uh, NHPs as per uh, Health Canada requirements. The primary warehouse has to be annexed to our site license. We also have a CFIA license uh, to act as a food importer, and that's under the Safe Food for Canadian regulations. That's a requirement for any foods that are being uh, imported into the Canadian market. Next slide. Our third uh, company, which is the youngest of the three, is uh, Cannabis Licensed Experts. This is um, fairly uh, a fairly new uh, area in Canada, uh, relatively speaking, uh, in terms of the the Cannabis Act. There, there, you know, cannabis regulations have existed prior to that, but the finalization in terms of recreational use. Um, came out in October of 2018. And so we started um, uh, in, in that year. Uh, and so uh, Cannabis License Experts offers uh, federal, provincial, and U.S. state. Uh, it's not federally legal in the United States, but we offer those state regulatory and compliance solutions, uh, both for cannabis and psychedelics businesses. So a full suite of uh, solutions there. Um, so collectively, our team uh, has the experience um, now, and we bring that experience of 350 plus cannabis licenses under all, all of these, um, these areas, federal, provincial, and, and U.S. state. Um, and uh, we offer, uh, beyond just cannabis licenses, we offer business uh, solutions as well. So that includes things such as business plan writing, design and build out, 
um, security equipment tendering, bud tender training, uh, real estate search, and much, much more. These are all things that you need um, to, to actually establish and grow your, your cannabis business or psychedelics business. And uh, yeah, next slide, I'm um, gonna pass this on now to um, uh, Mitch, who will be talking about uh, natural health products and foods in uh, Canada and the US. Thank you, Andrew. So in Canada, the supplements are referred to as natural health products. Um, this category may include products such as vitamins, sports nutrition, herbal products, homeopathics, and traditional medicines. Um, there are many different dosage forms, such as tablets, powders, gummies, etc. Uh, these dosage forms lend themselves to regimented dosing rather than ad libitum consumption. Um, there are many different routes of administration involved, oral, nasal, topical, etc. A very popular product over the past few years has been hand sanitizer that we've worked on. Um, there are three requirements to sell an NHP in Canada. These are uh, the license, the natural product number, a compliant bilingual label, and a Health Canada import agent if the product is manufactured outside of Canada. Um, an MPN is essentially the license issued by Health Canada to allow the sale of your product. Um, the timeline for these types of licenses uh, ranges from 60 to 210 days. And that is based on a class system, class one, two, and three products. Um, class one and two are based on the Health Canada published NHB monographs. Whether you're following one monograph or more than one would meet class one or two. And then class three would be for ingredients or claims that are non-monographed or outside of a published monograph. Um, in those cases, research is provided to support safety, efficacy, quality of the product. Um, Health Canada has published over 300 monographs for your reference and they're all available online to check out. Um, for these products, labels must be bilingual and meet the labeling regulations. Uh, we have a translator and technical team on staff to help with these label com compliance projects and, and to help your team out. Um, we also offer importer of record um, and this role is responsible for ensuring quality of NHPs for product mates outside of Canada. Um, if any NHPs are manufactured package label in Canada, that site would need to be um, obtaining a site license for, for their licensable activities. Um, again, the sister company Quality Import Solutions holds a site license and can annex your foreign sites and act as your importer for NHPs into Canada. Our company Quality Smart Solutions has successfully registered thousands of NHPs and we have an in-depth knowledge of products varying in degree of complexity and difficulty. Next slide, please. Um, so for the USA, they have their dietary supplements um, would be the, the parallel kind of pathway. So there's no formal licensing program to sell dietary supplements currently. The labels must be FDA regulations for dietary supplements under Deche. Um, it's strongly recommended that a notification pre-market is submitted 30 days prior. And uh, this allows for federal review of claims and formula. Um, foreign manufacturers must be registered with FDA and a US agent must be associated with that foreign manufacturer and the facilities are reviewed every other year. Um, you're limited to structure function claims on your packaging and marketing materials for these products. FDA has published guidance and resources for helping with navigate these and we can help you as well. Um, it's expected that all structure function claims be substantiated and are subject to federal and state checks. It's a good idea to have research on hand to support these claims that you're making on your product. Um, again, all ingredients must be grass, generally recognized as safe or ODI old dietary ingredients. Um, anything new, new dietary ingredients or NDIs must undergo a notification or review with the FDA. Um, next slide. Um, foods for Canada. So one thing to keep in mind is having a bilingual compliant label with a nutrition facts panel. Um, other components to consider are allergen statements, net weight, country of origin, list of ingredients, uh, among many more. Some conventional food examples to consider are bars, teas, beverages, frozen foods. Um, the use of these products are thought of more for ad libitum consumption rather than regimented dosing. So that is kind of the overarching difference between foods and NHPs for Canada. 
Um, supplemented foods are a subset of traditional foods and contain added active ingredients such as herbals, vitamins, minerals, amino acids, and caffeine. An example there would be Red Bull. Uh, these products require a temporary market authorization currently, and that licensing can take six, nine to 12 months in some cases based on Health Canada's internal queue and the complexity of the application. Um, for those licenses, annual reports and post-licensing conditions may be assigned by Health Canada, and those are in agreement during your um, review and licensing process. Um, to manufacture, package, label, import, or export foods, you must obtain a Safe Foods for Canadians import license. This is renewed every two years, and to obtain one of those, you need a food safety plan such as a PCP or HACCP prior. Um, quality import solutions. Our company holds a food import license under the SFCRs and can act as your importer for foods into Canada. Next slide. So USA Foods, um, remembering to have a compliant label hosting a nutrition facts panel and all other required items for your label. Those would be allergen statements, nutrient claims, net weight, et cetera. Um, exporting foods into the U.S., there must be an importer and a foreign supplier verification program agent as per, per the Food Safety Modernization Act. The FSVP agent ensures your suppliers have food safety plans in place to ensure traceability and quality of foods shipped to the U.S. Uh, foreign food manufacturers must be registered with the FDA every other year and must have a U.S. agent associated with the site. Same with domestic food manufacturers, they also have to have their facility registered. And with that, I will pass over to Kelpie. Thank you, Jeff. Um, awesome, thanks, Mitch. Okay, can we go to the next slide? Okay, um, so today I'll be covering the cosmetic portion of this presentation for both Canada and the USA. Um, so cosmetic compliance is a lot more simple than uh, some of the topics we've covered thus far. Um, and there are fewer things needed to meet regulatory requirements. Uh, so to start things off in Canada, there are two main components uh, involved in cosmetic compliance. Uh, the first being a bilingual and compliant product label. So this would mean the product label and all of the text on the product label must be in English and French, um, as well as the other required elements for your product label, such as the ingredient listing, the manufacturer information and product identity. Um, and then the second component is actually submitting a cosmetic notification to Health Canada within the first 10 days of sale of the products in Canada. So the notification process is a process by which the manufacturer or importer um, or a third party can disclose this product identity, form and function, ingredient information, um, and the contact information for the Canadian party uh, to Health Canada. Um, and then there are just a couple other things to mention for cosmetics in Canada. So uh, cosmetics cannot contain ingredients that are listed on Health Canada's cosmetic ingredient hot list. Um, and the ingredient hot list is kind of just a list of ingredients that have restrictions um, if they're placed in products in Canada, um, or some of them are just strictly prohibited because of safety concerns. Um, and then the other thing to mention is that cosmetics can only include um, non-therapeutic claims or cosmetic claims. Um, and this would be something like helps improve the look or the appearance of, um, as well as moisturizing, cleansing, or beauty related claims. Uh, next slide. Okay, so cosmetic compliance in the USA is very similar, um, and it might even be a little bit more simplistic than Canada. Um, cosmetics in the USA are not FDA approved, but they are FDA re regulated. So very similar to Canada, um, they generally, the regulators generally leave it to the manufacturer and or distributor to ensure compliance of the product. Um, so cosmetics in the USA must not be adulterated or misbranded. Um, and they require a compliant label as well. So this means they have to include um, some of those key elements such as the ingredient listing, uh, the manufacturer distributor information, um, as well as the product identity. Um, and labels in the USA only have to include English text, but they can also include additional languages. But again, it's up to the manufacturer distributor to ensure that that text is accurate if it's included in another language. Um, similar to Canada, or a little bit different, I guess, um, the FDA has a voluntary 
uh, cosmetic registration program, which can be used by manufacturers, packagers, or distributors. Um, and so these parties have the option to file a cosmetic product ingredient statement, um, which submits their information to the FDA, but submission of these is completely voluntary. Um, it's not a requirement. And finally, similar to Canada, uh, cosmetics in the USA can only include non-therapeutic claims, so cosmetic claims only. Next slide. Okay, I'll pass it over to Dreedy. Hello, everyone. So uh, I'll go ahead and speak on the drugs and medical devices. So to start off, we will be talking about the over-the-counter drugs within Canada. Uh, now, what are they? They are usually over-the-counter drugs such as acetaminophen, disinfectants, such like that. Um, and they usually require a DIN license or a drug identification number. The licensing usually ranges from 45 to 120 days. And um, if the over-the-counter uh, drugs are manufactured, packaged, labeled in Canada, we also need a drug establishment license. Uh, and usually uh, there's a fee around that from Health Canada. Uh, and uh, uh, the fees is associated into two parts. One is to register the drug, and then there is also uh, an establishment license uh, that is uh, par part of the cost recovery program. So there has been a slight increase, um, I believe, day before yesterday it was announced in the fees from Health Canada uh, by a percentage of 2 to 3%. Uh, so the fees can range from 1,600 for over-the-counter drugs to 300,000 for new drug submissions. So this might be a wide range, but um, this is just a rough idea of the uh, dollar value. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, in terms of over-the-counter uh, drugs in the USA, um, for that, you need to um, actually have an NDC label or code, uh, so which is really associated with your uh, product uh, or more like a label or code for your uh, drugs to be listed on the drug listing registration website. Uh, and these drug listings need to be renewed annually. Um, and also, if you have a foreign uh, drug manufacturing facility, you need to have that registered with the FDA, and it is usually on an annual basis. Um, we would also need a U.S. agent, which we do have, um, to support um, the linkage with the foreign registered site. Okay, next slide, please. In terms of medical devices, um, now shifting a little bit of gears, there are four types of medical devices uh, and we'll focus more on Canada. So the class one are medical devices that are not licensed. Uh, some examples are the N95 masks, the face shields, toothbrushes, tampons. Um, class two to class four, it require a registration and this can be uh, associated with um, MDSAP or a medical device single audit certification, which is equivalent to the ISO 13485 uh, for medical devices in order to register these class of devices. Uh, now, um, class two to class four, they vary in the type of requirements that you need for quality, uh, efficacy, safety uh, data as well. So uh, that, that's just a broad overview so that you get an idea of that. Uh, it's also recommended that the manufacturer has a device license and the brand developer have a private label manufacturer license so so that it's easier whenever there is an update with uh, the original manufacturer uh, you by law as a private label manufacturer have to update your device license as well so uh, so that they both correlate because without that then you cannot sell the product um, in terms of uh, small businesses uh, that have a total range of sales less than five million a year uh, that you can apply for a small business uh, fee reduction, which uh, reduces you the fee to Health Canada by 25%. Um, in terms of um, for importation and distribution, uh, the type of medical license you need is the called the Medical Device Establishment License or the MDEL. Uh, and um, this is required irrespective of any class uh, of medical devices, including class one. Uh, for manufacturing. Um, in terms of other types of uh, medical devices, 
Uh, there are also softwares uh, that can serve as a medical device uh, and they can be either uh, in vitro devices or non in vitro devices and it's basically uh, around the fundamental concept of the intent of use of the product. Um, and also with the interim order due to COVID, uh, Health Canada is now reviewing and providing authorization for a lot of COVID related products across all classes. Uh, however, please note that there is a considerable lead time delay to meet the service standards currently. Um, and uh, it's probably more than six months. Um, next slide, please. Uh, now we'll shift over to the US medical device market. So. Uh, there are three classes of medical devices and uh, they are classified by intent of use and indications of use. Um, mostly similar to Canada, class one medical devices do not require registration. Um, however, when you do want to register a device, uh, you would have to go through the 510K um, process for registering devices. Um, for foreign manufacturers, you must register, of course, your facility and have a US agent associated with that facility. We do have the US agents that we work with, so we can help you in regards to that manner. In terms of the fee to register a medical device facility, it's usually around 5,546. And uh, as mentioned with the Canadian um, increases for the fees, uh, this is um, also subject to increase based on inflation. Um, Again, this needs to be renewed annually from September to de December for the fiscal year. Um, other activities such as importing, distribution, packaging are also subject to registration as well. Um, again, for small businesses, uh, there is a um, reduced medical device user fee, uh, and this in excludes uh, facility activity registrations. Um, in terms of the software as a medical device, uh, it's also very similar to Canada based on the intent of use. Um, and basically it shouldn't have, uh, should be functional for, um, for a medical purpose uh, without the use of a hardware medical device. Uh, and again, they can be classified into in vitro and non in vitro uh, devices. Uh, also with COVID again, you have the emergency use authorization, which is the EUA application uh, and it's providing um, an FDA is doing a fantastic job of doing the authorizations across uh, these COVID related uh, products from all classes and uh, they have a very streamlined approach to meet the service standards. Um, next slide, please. And I will pass it over back to Andrew. Thank you. All right, thanks very much, Trudy. Um, okay, so uh, cannabis, we're gonna talk about uh, cannabis and psychedelics. So we're gonna start with the Canadian market, which is a uh, federally legal um, space. It's, uh, you know, you, you can obtain various types of licenses. There's a lot of different opportunities. So I'm just gonna run through these. Uh, there's obviously a lot of different nuances and requirements and whatnot that go into each of them. And we can always talk about that uh, um, after this, this presentation, if this is, a, this is what you're interested in, in getting into, into the cannabis space. But uh, you know, the, the, the first uh, type of license here, cultivation, is basically two types of uh, uh, cultivation license, which is really uh, about growing. Um, and so you can get a, a micro or a standard license, the difference being, um, a standard cultivation license, there is no limitation as to the number, or sorry, the, um, the uh, uh, growing space that you have, canopy space, um, whereas with a micro license, which is more craft growing, um, you're limited to 2,152 square feet. Uh, a nursery license, again, a growing license is really a, a much smaller space. It's really cultivation of genetics and you know, growing clones and seeds really to provide it to, um, to other, other cultivators. One thing to keep in mind here is that if you have a micro or standard uh, license, you can do the same activities as what a nursery license does. So you don't have to get a specific nursery license if you wanna be doing growing overall, you can basically do those, those activities under that, that micro standard cultivation license. Uh, processing license is really um, the, uh, the manufacturing side of things. So it can be everything from extraction, packaging, labeling, um, anything that you know gets that product into that finished 
for sale uh, uh, version of, 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 uh, of that cannabis. So um, now th this license is, uh, is required if you're planning to sell into, into the retail space um, with you know, government agencies buying from you, you do need a processing license. Um, now, uh, the, the next type of license here is listed is uh, medical sales. So this is really, uh, this is only for, uh, you can sell online only, and it can only be sold to registered patients. So those who have um, who've gone through, uh, you know, their physician, you know, and then from there, they apply to Health Canada to be a, a registered patient. And, uh, and so these medical sales license holders, um, they, they can sell medical cannabis, whether it's with or without possession. So with possession means they're actually storing that, that cannabis, all types of um, uh, formats, you know, uh, gummy bears through to um, uh, rolls and, and, and whatnot, pre-rolls. And so, um, so that, that, that with possession is your, you know, that site actually stores it. So there's security provisions. Without possession means that someone else is actually going to be storing it and, and fulfills it. So the orders go through your website uh, from that patient only. They'll purchase it from you. Somebody else fulfills it and ships it out from there uh, to, that, to that patient. Um, research license, uh, this doesn't allow you to sell it. it. There is limitations of how much you can hold as well. Um, there are fewer security uh, provisions with a research license, but all kinds of research uh, studies can be done under this, whether it's human clinicals, through to product development, growth studies, you know, there's, there's a lot of opportunities uh, there. Um, analytical testing is really what, what it says it is, is, you know, testing for purity, potency, identity of the cannabis. Um, so those are all federal licenses that I just outlined. Um, uh, the next one is, uh, is a provincial license, and that's a retail store license. Now, keep in mind, province by province, uh, it really varies. Uh, for example, Ontario, it's really a, a private system, uh, so anybody can obtain a retail license. Um, uh, and uh, the government does have what's called the OCS. The Ontario Cannabis Store, so that's where uh, online purchases can happen. That's really the only uh, government store um, that's out there. Uh, other private um, uh, systems, uh, retail store programs, basically, uh, include uh, British Columbia, uh, Alberta, Manitoba, Saskatchewan. So it's really, you know, going westbound from Ontario onwards are really that, that kind of a model, or it's a mix of that as well as a, a public uh, owned uh, outlets. Whereas when you're going, you know, in Quebec, for example, it's only government run. So there are no private stores. And then you, as you go into the Maritimes as well, um, there's kind of a, a mix of public and, and private. Um, Farmgate is really an evolving um, retail license. Uh, it, it's, it essentially is, it's not actually called a Farmgate license that you get. It's, it's, it's a provincial license that's issued. Uh, so in Ontario, um, really what, uh, so I, I'll take a step back here. Farmgate's really similar to, um, you know, if you look in the agricultural space where, you know, where they grow the strawberries, you can also buy it from a store out front or, or, or vineyards, uh, wineries where, you know, it's, it's grown there, the grapes are grown there, they're, it's, um, you know, bottled, packaged, and you can buy it from a storefront. So that's, it's going to mimic that, it mimics that kind of a, a model. So there, there's a few in Ontario now that have received um, this retail license at, this, at the site that they're at. So they would, they would be processing license holders, uh, just as they would be selling uh, that cannabis to, um, to stores, or sorry, to, to, the, um, to the OCS, uh, who would then allow um, uh, dispensaries to, to buy from them wholesale. This would be this would allow for um, those who have that storefront uh, at that site to sell directly to the consumer through a flow through model that is right now in is is evolving and we should see that finalized um, very shortly here. So it will it will make the process much smoother than what it is right now. And I'm just talking Ontario. BC is going through its program, which will probably be launching later later this this year, probably in the summertime. It'll actually even potentially allow cultivators to actually sell, you know, uh, right directly to, uh, to consumers instead of having to get a processing license. But again, that's still in the works. We'll get some more clarity over the next uh, few months here. Uh, and we see other provinces, uh, at least those that, have, that allow for a private uh, license, 
program to, to also um, allow these farm gate um, uh, programs, these licenses uh, to, to, uh, to come up as well. So that's, that's really exciting. Um, you know, uh, part of, part of the, the retail uh, program that's, that's ever evolving. Uh, next slide. Okay, so the US, uh, not federally legal. Uh, that is, it's hard to say when that'll happen. Um, I was I was on a session just yesterday um, with, with a group of um, uh, policy advisors and whatnot. And, and so there's talk that maybe, you know, over the next year or two under the current Biden administration that it may happen. And it may be actually pushed more on the Republican side. Um, but as it stands right now, it's really uh, state driven. So each state uh, can choose to create their own program, uh, medical or recreational. So it's kind of a mix. There's 36 states that right now uh, um, allow for medical use. 18 of those are, are recreational. There's a couple right now that are in process that should be in the next few, few months here to, to open up um, uh, for, for allowing um, uh, cannabis, uh, either in a medical or recreational standpoint. We know Connecticut's opening up um, uh, next month. New Jersey just opened up applications, uh, accepting applications back in uh, December. New York State is the, is the big one that everyone is really wait, wait, uh, waiting for. Now they, you know, there's kind of rumblings that'll probably be, or it either will be, or it might get close to being the, the biggest market in the United States. Right now, California is the biggest uh, cannabis market. So um, uh, one of the things to kind of keep in mind too is, um, you know, all because uh, cannabis may be legal in a certain state, whether medical or recreational, doesn't necessarily mean that it's, it's accepted in every single county and municipality. Uh, and so, you know, uh, for example, uh, there was just the opt-in, opt-out program that uh, New York just uh, closed out on here uh, just earlier uh, this month. And so um, that, that creates another kind of complexity to, to starting a cannabis business in, in those legal states. Um, and so it really requires a lot of due diligence down to the um, county and municipality level to really check to make sure that uh, you know you you can start a cannabis business, there is also um, you know certain states have kind of a quota system of how many licenses they issue. Um, so that's another piece that's really important to actually uh, you know check check into. Um, so uh, you know that's that's again it's it's very much an evolving uh, area uh, the U.S. and and um, you know. Eventually, there will be some sort of a federal legal program, likely following the alcohol and tobacco uh, federal program that currently exists. So, you know, that's where you can really get a lot of clues as to what the final federal program will ultimately uh, look like. Next slide. So, uh, so uh, psychedelics um, uh, in Canada. This is this is again a very it's evolving. It's, um, uh, you know, over the last, I'd say, year and a half now, there's been a lot of momentum. Uh, there's a lot of studies that are happening with, um, you know, uh, uh, clinical research related to treatment for various um, uh, mental uh, disorders, PTSD, anxiety, depression, uh, and whatnot. So that's you know, that's clearly getting uh, attention by, by Health Canada. And so um, uh, the way to, to gain access into this space, psychedelics are uh, considered controlled substances, basically in the same lines as, as other nar narcotics, at least on a, on a category uh, regulatory standpoint. Um, some of these, these psychedelics, uh, psilocybin being the most popular uh, from coming from uh, um, uh, mushrooms, but also MDMA, DMT, um, ketamine, and LSD are, are other psychedelics. Um, so a dealer's license is required. I, I know it's a little bit of a strange name, um, but it, it is the term that Health Canada is used now. Uh, and that's governed by the, um, th this division called Controlled Drug Substances Act. That's, that's the act that, that, uh, uh, in which these narcotics, psychedelics, controlled substances fall under. A dealer's license is required uh, to conduct these activities, just like in other areas where there's a site license for natural health products, cannabis license for you know, cannabis, establishment license for drugs, you know, medical device establishment license for medical devices. 
Similarly, a dealer's license is for you know, psychedelics. Um, various activities that can be, uh, you know, that, that fall under the, this dealer's license, packaging, production, transportation, distribution, research and development, lab analysis, clinical studies, importing and exporting. Um, Section 56 exemption has been uh, used, uh, I'm sure you've, you've heard about this on the news where uh, it's been granted to, uh, to patients, um, you know, for, for whether it's for treatment and therapy or even uh, during, uh, if it's palliative uh, care or end of life uh, kind of requests. Unfortunately, that, that program has taken, you know, over, over 100 days uh, in many cases to, to get that exemption. And so uh, Health Canada just recently, just a few weeks ago, uh, they, they amended the special access program now, and it will allow for faster access to many of these treatments with psychedelics in as little as uh, one to two uh, working days now. So that's a, that's a huge, huge change. Very exciting for, for the psychedelics um, you know, sector and industry. And, and so I think that'll just continue the impetus. Now, I, I should clarify also that Health Canada did make it clear um, when, they, when they came out with that uh, announcement that this, isn't, this is not going to be, uh, this doesn't mean that they're going to open it up for recreational and, and full, a full program like, like Canada's has, right? So this is a, this is a baby step uh, that, you know, these are baby steps that, that Health Canada is taking. And it, you know, they're being very, you know, cautious about this. And and really, psychedelics is not something that, um, you know, should be used similar to to recreational cannabis. It really is is for medical purposes, and and I think it will really stay under under this, um, you know, just in terms of my opinion, um, as as this evolves and and as this this uh, you know sector uh, grows. So. Um, so yeah, a lot of exciting areas that here uh, happening in, in psychedelics. So so keep an eye on that. Uh, next slide. All right. So that's really um, you know, a lot a lot that we covered here uh, from natural health products to to psychedelics. Um, and so uh, you know we have uh, about fifteen minutes left here uh, to kind of answer your questions. I, I I saw some questions coming through. And I, I, uh, I answered uh, a bunch of them, but, um, but yeah, uh, feel free to, uh, you know, drop in your, your questions into the, uh, into the Q and A. Um, you can, you know, here's your chance to kind of capture this information from us uh, in terms of uh, how to kind of reach us. Uh, info at Quality Smart Solutions, um, or you can reach us at 1-800-396-5144 extension one. These are our two websites where you can learn more about uh, our import services and our regulatory services on quality smart solutions and quality import solutions. And then everything under the cannabis and psychedelics uh, side of things, uh, regulations, um, quality assurance support, business solution supports. Uh, you can visit our website, uh, cannabislicenseexperts.com. A ton of information there. Uh, you'll be reading for days uh, on, on that site. And you can reach us at info at cannabislicenseexperts.com as well. So um, great. So uh, just reading some questions here. Uh, uh, so one of the questions, in which segment of the cannabis value chain are you seeing the most growth at this stage in the market? Which ones appear the most profitable? So um, I'd say uh, processing. Uh, I think there's that's where there's the most most growth and opportunity. Uh, and so you know you have to think processing is almost like manufacturing, right? So you you can be processing for yourself for your own brand, or you can be a private label processor like a tool manufacturer. Um, it also gives you a lot of opportunities, you know, in terms of if you ex expand your business into selling your own brand. Um, uh, to 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 uh, government uh, agencies who are going to buy uh, and really the profit margins are, are there if you're going to make your own product um, you know uh, clearly you're you know that's it's it just it follows similar to to what the CPG world has uh, where margins are are considerably better on that side than it is on the raw material side and you have to keep in mind the raw material side of it, you know, growing it, there's, there's a lot of things that you have to really control. You should have a very, very good master grower. Uh, they're really the piece of that equation to, to be successful. It's, it's not about your investors. It's about your master grower on the, uh, on the cultivation side. So, um, and, you know, with cultivation, the, the price per gram is 
consistently dropping. Um, and um, there's a lot of variables in, in, in growing. Uh, it's no different than any other raw material out there. So, um, so that's really where I see uh, most of the opportunities is really there. I mean, obviously in retail, there still is some white space in Ontario. Um, it does look very saturated when you look in the GTA area, particularly when you go on the AGCO's uh, map. But overall, there are still areas out in the rural areas. We, we still get inquiries uh, on that. And, you know, you look out that area, that's where there still is, um, you know, stores that will be opening uh, in the retail space, at least in Ontario. Um, other provinces, obviously, smaller population, you know, you'll see that reflected in terms of the number of stores that'll, that'll actually open up. So, um, so yeah, hopefully I have answered that question for you, Nicholas. Um, yeah, so I had a question about just the presentation. We will have this uh, presentation, like a, a, a video of it uh, available on YouTube and we'll have a link on our website and, um, and we'll, we'll let you, all of the um, attendees know about this as well. So, um, okay, what is the classification of the eye drops both in Canada and the US? So natural uh, extracted natural mo molecule for preserving tissues. So in Canada, um, probably looking at a natural health product pathway. In the United States, I believe it will be a drug um, the route of administration for dietary supplements is oral. Um, you know, anything that's topical will either be cosmetic or OTC. Same thing with anything that's going through the eyes uh, would be um, uh, a, a drug, uh, really. So, uh, which is, you know, as a natural ingredient, um, really tricky. It'd probably have to be a new drug, very, very expensive, millions of dollars. Uh, and, you know, FDA fees are over a million dollars on, on its own for a new drug. So, um, but there may be, you know, maybe something uh, on that side. Well, yeah, if, if you have an OTC ingredient um, that's used for, for eye, eye use and you combine that with a plant ingredient, that may be a route to go. But, um, but you know, that's something that uh, definitely love to talk with you more about that after this, this session. So please do reach out to us. Um, is a soap, face cream, lotion, toner, moisturizer, serum can classify as cosmetics? Yes, um, uh, absolutely. Uh, you just have to make sure that you're not, you know, again, ingredients that can't be on the hot list. You're not making health claims, uh, you know, therapeutic, preventative, structure, function, but absolutely all of those uh, can, can be cosmetics. Um, the video will be sent to you. Yes. Uh, what requirements must, must a European manufacturer meet with regards to the quality management system up to which class is the cert certificate according to ISO 13485 accepted? This is a really loaded question. Um, that's something that probably we best talk after this uh, session and, and one of our our experts can, um, can, can guide you through that. Just to keep in mind, if this is about medical devices, to sell medical devices in Canada, you do need ISO 13485 as a basis, but you really do need MDSAT, Medical uh, Device Single Audit Program. That is a requirement for Canada. It is not required for the United States, but uh, the expectation is you do have a, an ISO 13485 program uh, in the US, and that'll, um, you know, I, I believe, re reduce the amount of uh, FDA kind of um, audits and, and whatnot that they will do if you are, if you have that ISO certification. Uh, I don't know, Dridi, if, if you want to add anything into that question. So there is actually a recent change within the U.S. where they are looking to start to adopt ISO 13485 as well, which is going to be eventually the global standard. So we highly recommend that you should have an ISO 13485 because um, MDSAP in Canada is all by itself, but they do recognize uh, the equivalency from certain registrar auditors or bodies that uh, conduct or give you the ISO 13485 certification as well. Um, so um, your best bet to be able to market globally is ISO 13485. Great. Thanks. Thank um, let's see. Uh, I realize the cost wasn't covered yet. So yeah, please do reach out to us and we can talk about the you know, scope of work, what, what you're looking for, and, and we can talk about uh, our services in more details. 
Uh, question about registering veterinary products. Good question. We didn't actually touch upon that. Uh, so in Canada, uh, uh, veterinary products fall into one of two categories, either they're, they're, they're drugs or they're veterinary health products, VHPs. Um, so VHPs, it's, um, it's a pathway to obtain a, uh, a notification number. So that number then allows you to, to sell your veterinary product. In Canada, you have to ensure that uh, the ingredients are all under the permitted substances list. If they're not, they have to be added to that first before the product can go through registration. Uh, I'll touch upon really quickly here, USA, there is no veterinary health product program. It's either a drug, it, 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 you know, the area of dietary supplement, uh, doesn't really exist for, for veterinary products. Um, so it's really a, a risk-based approach. Um, you know, I'll, you'll see a lot of brands on Amazon that list their products and they have a dietary supplement panel. It's technically not correct. It's not accurate. Um, so, but it is a, you know, the FDA is not really, um, uh, you know, going after them and, and enforcing it. You just have to be careful really when it comes to the U.S. not making drug claims, right? That's where most warning letters happen on, on human products. It would happen the same on veterinary products. So you, you cannot be making drug claims on, on dietary supplements. So, uh, so yeah, VHPs is the pathway in Canada. Happy to talk with you uh, after the show about that, as, after, uh, sorry, after this webinar about it as well. Um, in regards to selling food, what are the qualifications that make it natural or organic? Do I need to reach out to the government of Canada? Yeah, so um, organic, uh, um, there's, a, there's a certification program for it to be certified organic, which is 95% uh, of the ingredients have to be that way. There is other language that you can say contains organic ingredients where you're not at that 95% threshold. Um, but in order to have that really saying certified organic, you have to go through a certification body. There are many agencies that actually offer that program, both in Canada and the US. And, the and Canada, Health Canada accepts many of the, of the US programs as, as they do in Canada. So, um, so yeah, that's kind of that area. Natural is a, really, is a term that you have to be really careful about. There's been an uh, increasing number of litigation, particularly in the United States, when you're using all natural or natural when there are other ingredients that are in fact not natural based. So, um, so yeah, really, you know, it's important to have someone review that and be, you know, uh, just make sure that how you're using that, that terminology is in fact accurate. So, um, yeah, we have, I think three minutes left. Uh, does, I don't see any more questions come through. So, um, yeah, we can probably wrap it up here, but, uh, please do reach out to us, uh, after, the session will um, we'll be here to, to help you and um, yeah, look forward to serving your Health Canada and FDA compliance needs. Awesome, thank you, Andrew, for the presentation today. Obviously a hot topic, lots of questions coming in there. Um, and thank you everybody for joining. Uh, as Andrew mentioned, he'll be uh, posting this link on his website and I believe YouTube for you guys to rewatch. Thanks again, Thanks everyone. everyone. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.